Um, thank you very much for joining us on this uh, night before the exam physics paper two revision hangout. Um, just going to give you a couple of key reminders as we start this video. Make sure you get a good night's sleep tonight, eat a really good breakfast, um, and then double check your equipment. Now for physics paper two, the equipment is just a little bit, a little bit different from the other science papers. You want to make sure that you have got a protractor with you. Um, because there's uh, a few um, topics on forces where they might need for you to take measurements um, with a protractor. Okay, so make sure you bring in a protractor tomorrow. Okay, let's get started. So, just like we've done before, we're going to go through some of the required practicals first. Um, then we're going to have a look at some of the math skills. Then we're going to have a little look at the content. Um, pretty much everything I do to start off with is combined science. Um, there'll be a couple of little bits of separate science that you see coming up. So I'm going to go through the required practical for the separate bit. Combined scientists can ignore that while I do that. Um, so let's get started. So the first one of the required practicals for physics paper two is the Hooke's law um, practical. So to do with springs, um, looking at adding forces to springs and having a look at their extension. And this uses our equation of F equals uh, uh, KE or EK. Um, so that might be a nice way of remembering it around that way. Um, so what is this all about then? What's this practical about? Okay, well, if I add a, if I add masses to a spring, um, it makes the spring get longer by the same amount each time um, until too much weight is added. And then when too much weight is added, the spring goes past what we call its elastic limit, basically means it's overstretched and it's not going to return to its original length. The experiment uses the equation of F equals Ke, uh, where F is our force that we're applying to the uh, spring. K is its spring constant, which is like the kind of stretchiness of the spring. Um, if that is a real word. And then we've got E ex for standing for extension. Um, and you can see the units here that those things are measured in. Now, the, to work out the extension of a spring, it's going to be the length of the spring, um, like the, the new length of the spring, take away the start length of the spring. And so the extension is the bit in, in, in between the two. Okay, so if we were to do a method for this uh, for this practical, you're going to want to uh, attach a ruler to a clamp stand, and you're going to use a pointer or an arrow to read the length easily. So you can see they've attached this ruler to the side of the spring there. You're going to want to measure the start length, so that's denoted up here. That's the start length of the spring. And then you're going to add masses. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter what mass you choose. 100 grams seems like a reasonable amount to use. Now, don't forget that we're measuring the force here, and when you add 100 gram mass, you've got to use weight equals mass times gravity to find the force applied. You won't necessarily have to include that in your method. You're going to record the final length for the spring each time. So that's um, the end of the spring there uh, from the start to the end of the, of the spring with the, with the mass on it. And then you're going to do the final length minus the original length to give us the extension. Now, the spring should extend by the same amount each time. And if it does extend more, it means it's past its elastic limit, it's overstretched. Now, if it extends by the same amount each time, we should end up with a graph, which for the largest part of the graph shows a directly proportional relationship between our force and our extension. Uh, directly proportional meaning um, as I double one value. So if I take my F reading there and my E reading there, if I double the force applied up to here, it should double the extension as well. That would be directly proportional. Now, there's a classic mistake that is actually shown on this graph here. The classic mistake in uh, doing a Hooke's Law experiment is forgetting to, uh, to take the extension and just using the final length of the spring. Now, of course, the final, uh, if you're using the final length of the spring, you'll see that when there's no force added on it, so there's no force on the spring, um, there is already an extension. Well, that can't be possible if there's no force on the spring because there isn't an extension. There should have an extension of zero. So this would be called a systematic error. This would be a systematic error because it's the same error that is being applied to every measurement. Every measurement has got an extra 50, uh, 50 mill millimeters on it. Okay, let's just say that there was a, a little outlying point here that wasn't on the line of best fit, could have been for many different reading reasons, maybe uh, not reading the uh, reading from uh, exactly where the, uh, you know, in, in line with the end of the spring, maybe you had your eyes slightly further down, and you were measuring, um, measuring the wrong length of the spring there, well, that would be a random error. 
So if it's just a, a one-off mistake, we're going to call it a random error. Try not to use the word human error. They're going to prefer that word random there. Or systematic is where it's the same error every time. Now, there can be some improvements that we make to a Hooke's Law um, experiment. I've seen this question come up a few times. So improvements might be how to improve the accuracy or, or validity of this experiment. Maybe use smaller masses. So maybe use 50 gram masses or 10 gram masses. Uh, that's going to be us having a, a smaller resolution of masses. You might also want to use a bigger or larger range of masses, range being the um, top value to the bottom value of the masses you add on there. By having a bigger range, we're going to be able to see for sure where the, uh, where the spring goes past its elastic limit. And on our graph here, the point where we're adding too much force is going to be shown by where the line is starts to curve. So we could say that probably somewhere around here, we can call that the limit of proportionality or where it no longer follows Hooke's law or where it's gone past its elastic limit. OK, the next practical is going to be uh, an experiment um, with an air track and a trolley whizzing across a, a table. Uh, th this one is used to vary the force applied to an object or the mass of the object um, to be able to help us to prove that F equals MA. Now, F equals MA is a really important one in this, in this uh, topic. And if you change it around the other way to FAM, it might make it slightly more, more easy for you to remember it. F equals A times M. And this is where a trolley, so a trolley over here, can glide on a frictionless air track. So there's air being pumped out of the, um, of the uh, air track here, meaning that the trolley can kind of glide along it. We're going to have weights attached to one end of a string. And these weights are just here, and they're going to have a force downwards due to gravity on the weight on them. And we're going to use light gates up here to calculate the acceleration. Remembering we're trying to prove that F equals A times M or M times A, we need to be measuring our A. So our light gates, let's find the acceleration. Now we can either change the force as it's being accelerated, or we can change the mass of the trolley to see the effect on the acceleration. And we would only change one of those at a time. OK, so here's a typical method for this one then. So step one, you're going to attach the trolley to a, str a string, pass the string over a pulley at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the bench there. It's just a wheel, really, for the string to pass over. You're going to add mass to the end of the spring here. This will provide a constant force on the trolley. You're going to use the light gates to measure the acceleration. So that's going to be our A. This is providing our F. And uh, we're going to keep, for this experiment here, we're going to keep the mass the same. So, or we could change the force we're pulling it for. So we could either increase the mass placed on the trolley, stack more masses on, or we can add more pulling force by adding masses to the weights at the end. Now, a note with this one is, is that if you're adding masses to the end, you want to keep the whole mass of the system the same. So take a mass off of the trolley and pop it onto the hook down there. That way you're keeping the mass of the system the same, but you're increasing the uh, force that's pulling it. So the results would be that force is directly proportional to acceleration. So force is directly proportional to acceleration. Or that mass, if I have my force along the bottom and my mass is there, we're going to see an inversely proportional relationship with those as I double my force. So here's my force value, my first one. As I double the force value, my mass value goes down by half. Okay, so how the light gates might work. We don't see questions on this very often, but um, you, you might, need to, might, might need to know it for the exam. So light gates work by measuring the time interval that they're interrupted by by a piece of card on top of the trolley up here. So we've got a piece of card that pokes up, and here we've got a little laser beam that goes across through the light gate. They're attached to a computer that can use the length of the card to work out the speed. So what they do is they use the length of the card interrupting the beam, and they work out the speed that that piece of card is going past by the length of the card divided by the time interval that it breaks the beam for. Now the card is U-shaped, as you can see here, so it breaks the beam twice. The computer works out the speed of the first card, and the speed of the second card, and then finds the acceleration using A equals V minus U over T, which is the change in speed of the two cards over the time um, between them. And that gives us the acceleration. So uh, another required practical is measuring the speed of waves. Now, there's a, about three or four of these ones. Um, half of them use the equation of V equals F lambda, 
I think one of the most important equations in this physics paper too. So V meaning velocity of the wave, F meaning the frequency, and lambda meaning the wavelength of the wave. We'll have a look at how we measure those on a wave in a second. Or they might be using our equation speed equals distance over time. Okay, so we have some waves on a string. Uh, we might see waves on a spring, and we might also see waves in water. Now have a look at these waves on a string. Okay, so one wave has to be include an up and a down bit, so that's going to be one wave all the way over to there. And on a spring, we're looking to go from our areas of compression, where the springs are squidged up, to the next bit where the springs are squidged up. And again, we'll have a closer look at that in a minute. Now, we might also be doing uh, measuring the speed of waves in air. So waves in air is from air particles where they're squidged up to an area where they're spread out. And a general tip about all of these practicals is, is that you need a vibration generator. And that's going to make, you're going to set um, something to vibrate at the frequency that you want. You're going to be telling it F in our equation of V equals F lambda. And if the waves are small, measure lots of them and divide by the number you've got to get the length of one. Okay, so let's start off with our ripple tank um, method then. So we've got our ripple tank here, which is a tray. And we're going to fill it with just a little bit of water. One or two centimetres will be fine. You're going to connect a dipper to a frequency generator. So here we have, it's called the oscillating paddle in this diagram. But here is our dipper. This piece of board will go up and down. And it's going to go up and down at the frequency that you set. So you're going to tell it uh, what frequency you want. You're going to turn the lamp on above it. So just a, a, an ordinary lamp there. And you're going to make sure that the room has uh, got dim lights in it. You're going to then measure the length of 10 of the moving wave shadows that appear under the tank. Now, you're going to struggle with a ruler to just measure the length of one wave between two of the lines. So measure between 11 of the lines. 11 of the lines will mean that that is 10 waves long, Okay, because you get one at the start and one at the end for each wave. So that will tell you lambda, the wavelength. So you've set F. You're, being, uh, you're measuring lambda in order to find V. You're going to divide it by 10 to get the average wavelength because you've measured 10 waves. Then you're going to use V equals F times lambda to find V. Now, if you're using a strobe light, the strobe light flashes at the same rate as the waves are made. So the waves appear on the screen um, and they stand still, making it easier to measure the lengths of 10 waves. So if you can, a strobe light would be better than just an ordinary um, light bulb. OK, so waves on a spring. Uh, sorry, on a string. So really similar method. This time we've got a vibration generator set the frequency we want to give us F. Here's our vibration generator. We'll make this part of the wire just move up and down, giving us a transverse wave that will move down the string. We're going to attach some weights to the other end of the pulley. This isn't to um, make the string move. This is to actually keep the string taut to make it tight so that we can see the waves appear on it easily. We're going to measure the length for a one wavelength. And again, one wavelength has an up bit and a down bit. So one wavelength will be that length there. And this is going to tell you the wavelength. We then use the frequency from the, freq uh, from the signal generator. And then we use V equals F times lambda. Now, should, we try and, should you be asked to find the uh, speed of sound waves in air, then there's a few different methods for this. So we can attach a speaker to a signal generator. Again, that is going to be set to give us our, uh, a set frequency. An invisible sound will appear in front of the speaker with peaks and troughs in front of it. And it's going to look literally a bit like that. And you're going to need a, an oscilloscope with a, a dual screen oscilloscope. And we're going to have two microphones, which at the minute are in the same place. So we've got two microphones there. And here you can see the um, the waves on the screen when I first turn it on. Both microphones are in the same place, so they're detecting exactly the same wave. Now, what I need to do is start with them both together and then move one of them slowly until it is one complete wavelength away from the other. So I'm going to bring one microphone away just a little bit. And then as I do that, I'm going to see one of these waves is going to move, is going to slide across the, the screen. So I can measure the distance, or I'll move it until it is one complete wavelength away. So on the screen, this top wave will move until it has moved one whole wavelength across. So I've moved my microphone exactly one wavelength apart. 
I've seen on the screen that there's moved one la wavelength apart, and then I literally measure with a ruler the distance between the microphones. So that distance between the microphones tells me my wavelength. So I've now got my frequency from the signal generator, my lambda, my wavelength from measuring the distance between the two speakers, put them into my V equals F lambda equation, and hey presto. So if I need to do a, a similar one, um, measuring the sound, uh, the speed of sound waves in air, you, this time we're going to use speed equals distance over time. So I've got two microphones attached to a laptop. I've already measured the distance between them. Doesn't matter how far. I then use a bell or a starter gun to make a sharp noise. The laptop records the time delay, how long it takes for the, for the sound to go from one to the other. You then measure the distance with a ruler between the two microphones. So now to find the speed of sound here, we have got the distance between the two microphones and the time it took for them to go past, giving us the speed of sound in air. Another method, the echo method. So this time you might have a, uh, a wall. You've got something that's going to make a loud noise, in this case a cannon. Then you've, got, you've measured the distance with a tape measure to know how far away the wall is. So you, you measure a set distance from a wall, you make a loud noise, you use a stopwatch to record the time for the sound to travel to the wall and back again, remembering that that sound hits the wall and comes back again. So you've got to divide the time taken by two, because we only want to know how long it took for the sound to go from the cannon to the wall. Then we're going to use our distance from the wall, divided by the time it took for the sound to go to the wall, but not back again. Uh, and that will give us our speed of sound in air. And definitely we want to be using as much electronic equipment in this as we can, using a, a real, uh, just using a person with a stopwatch is not very accurate. So uh, another required practical <clears throat> is radiation emitted from different color surfaces. So if we want to investigate how the surface color affects the amount of infrared emitted from a surface, well then we're going to use one of these devices called a Leslie Cube. And the Leslie Cube has got uh, different colors on the outside of it. And here you can see an infrared image of it. Now, the brighter here, the hotter. So you can see that the different sides have got different uh, radiant temperatures. And we're going to fill a cube um, with boiling water. So that way, we know that actually the inside of the cube is the same temperature. Um, we're going to use a ruler just to mark off a certain distance away from it. We want to be measuring using our, our infrared thermometer at the same distance away from each wall. Hold an infrared thermometer at the same distance. Now, if, if you change the distance, that will affect the amount of infrared being detected. So we're going to record the radiant temperature. This is what we might expect. So matte black, that sort of dull black, is the best emitter. So that's going to have the highest temperature. Shiny silver is going to be the worst emitter, so it's going to have the lowest temperature. Okay, now this one is a separate physics only. I'm not going to take long going through this, so just hold tight any combined scientists. So the aim here is to see how different materials bend or reflect, ref, refract light differently. Uh, the independent variable here will be the type of block to see how the angle of refraction changes with different types of material. Our dv is going to be the angle of refraction coming through here and the angle of incidence, we're going to want to keep the same, so that's going to be our control variable. So method for this, draw around the block on a piece of paper, shine a beam of light at the block so it comes through the block and out the opposite side, mark the beams on using X's, remove the block, turn off the lights, join up the X's so that they show a beam going through. You'll have lots of X's out here, and you will remove the block, and you'll just draw a line through all of those X's, and a, a line going through the block to connect those rays. We're going to draw a normal. Now, the reason why we draw a normal is so that we can measure this angle of incidence from between the normal and the ray. We're going to measure and record the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction. We're going to replace the block, keeping the angle of incidence the same, measuring the angle of refraction each time. And, of course, repeat and take means. And again, just really quickly, reflection through different substances. So our aim here is to see how different materials reflect light differently. Uh, IV, independent variable, will be the type of surface we're using. Uh, DV, angle of reflection, or it could be the brightness of the reflection, or it could be the width of the reflected beam. We're going to keep the same angle of incidence each time. So our method here could be 
place a mirror upright on a line on a piece of paper uh, shine a beam of light at the mirror so you can see the reflected beam mark the beam uses using x's same as last time mark the width or the brightness of the beam this time so we might have um, a kind of reflection being spread out um, due to the type of material that we're uh, we're reflecting with like a piece of paper possibly remove the mirror turn off the light join up the X's again draw a normal so that we can measure our angle of incidence and angle of refraction that is our normal there 90 degrees to the surface measure and record the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction replace the mirror with other surfaces for example paper um, shiny plastic things like that keeping the angle of incidence the same measuring the angle of refraction the brightness or the beam width each time now what are we going to expect from this well smooth surfaces such as glass are going to reflect the same beam width they're going to have the same angle and the same brightness rough surfaces will dim the brightness and they'll also spread the brightness out because of this thing called diffuse reflection where they're spreading out because the surface is a little bit bumpy Okay, back on with combined science then. So we're going to have a quick look at some of the main math skills in this paper, about 30% of the paper being um, maths requirements. So let's have a look at our equations that we're going to need to recall in this topic then. So weight equals mass times gravity. That's a key one. Remembering that weight and mass are two different things. Mass is the amount of stuff you're made of. Weight is how hard you push on the floor. Our Wuffus equation, so that's work done equals our force applied over a distance. So when I'm pushing a box by a certain distance, okay, I'm gonna be applying a certain force to it. There is my force, there is my distance that I'm pulling it over. I can work out how much work that takes for me to pull it that far. Our F equals EK equation, our um, moment of a force equals force times distance. Now that is a separate science only equation. So this is for turning forces. If I'm trying to open something, there's my perpendicular distance there and my force. Um, pressure, pressure equals force over area. Again, that's separate only. And then this equation, a really key one to know. So distance equals speed times time, or speed equals distance over time. We've already seen that one used in a required practical. So speed equals distance over time. So some of our units that we're going to need to know, weight is a force, so it's measured in newtons. Mass, take care of mass. Mass is the only one where the SI unit includes kilograms. So we want it to be in kilograms. Unlike all the other ones, we don't want them to be in kilo anything. Distance in meters, moments in newton meters. New, um, newton meters, there shouldn't be a little slash there. It should just be nm. Uh, pressure is in pascals, or again, that could be newtons uh, per meter squared. Uh, area, meter squared, as we can see there, speed, meters per second. Okay, a couple more equations to recall. So our acceleration is the change in speed per second. That's what acceleration means, change in speed per second. Uh, our FAM equation and our momentum equals mass times velocity. Be prepared to, um, to, to quote that as the definition of momentum. What is the definition of momentum when well, it's mass times velocity? Our V equals F lambda equation, really key to this topic. You've seen all those required practicals that need it. Make sure you learn that one. Some of our units we're using here, okay, acceleration is meters per second squared because it's, it's meters per second divided by seconds, so meters per second squared. Uh, time, force, we've seen before. Watch out for your kilograms. We want to be using things in kilograms. There's our momentum. So again, for momentum, we can work out those units if we can't remember them. Why? Because mass is measured in kilos. Speed, V, is measured in meters per second. So you can work out the units for momentum. Frequency is measured in hertz. That means how many times per second a wave goes past. And wavelength just in meters because it's a length. So if we're going to be selecting equations from the equation sheet, um, we can select v squared minus u squared equals 2as. So be prepared. They should say in the question, use the equation sheet to help you. But I would definitely recommend when you've got numbers in your uh, in your question, like meters per second squared, that you just write next to that A equals in your question. Really helps you to identify those, those, those values so that you can pick out the right equation. Period equals one over frequency for a wave. Okay, so the time period is the length of time it takes for one wave to go past. 
if you're measuring it. And the frequency is how many times per second that wave, um, how many times per second that wave goes past. Oh, sorry, how many waves per second go past. So uh, higher tier might be using this F equals B I L equation. Uh, you'll be needing to spot that in, an, in, in the question. Probably is going to be the magnetic flux density that helps you to pick that out. It's the only equation that uses that. So these will all be found on the separate science um, equation sheet. Um, density equals rho g h or h rho g, so the height of a fluid column times the pressure times the gravity. Now I go through each of these equations again um, slightly later. This one can appear on the higher physics. Um, now they can't really ask you any content questions about this. This is just an equation for you to select and apply it. Um, to the to the question and as long as you're substituting in your values correctly that this is the um, number of turns on a transformer um, the number of turns of the wire on the transformer you'll be absolutely fine okay one for the separate scientists magnification is image height over object height and then there's this one here that we might need to select too that I'm going to go through in a bit more detail later Okay, so let's have a look at some exam technique then. So don't forget to bug your exam questions. So that means box your command word. It means underline your key values. Okay, that means you can look back at it and it makes it a little bit easier for you to, to, to know what you're doing. I would also recommend highlighting any um, units you're going to need to change and what the physical quantity is each time. I think that just gives it a little bit, makes it a little bit easier for you to pick them out. So I've got V and F, and it's asking me to find the wavelength lambda. Okay, so look at the number of marks. It's going to give you an indication of how much work you're going to need to do. Check your units and convert them. There we go. Killer being a thousand. Recall your equation, V equals F lambda. Rearrange the equation. I'll go through that in just a second. Substitute in our values. Okay, our new values there. Put them into the calculator, and there's our answer. Now, with our prefixes, you definitely want to listen to the song if you haven't yet, the prefix song by Revision Monkey. So we've got our giga. How, uh, giga means 10 to the 9. So if I want to turn 11 gigahertz into hertz, I'm going to times it by 10 to the 9. Mega, 10 to the 6. Killer, 10 to the 3. You'll notice that these go up by three zeros each time. Now, when I'm using my milli, micro, nano, I'm making things smaller. So milli, divide by 1,000 or... One time uh, times it by 10 to the minus 3. Micro times 10 to the minus 6. Nano times 10 to the minus 9. So you see the pattern there, minus 9, minus 6, minus 3, 3, 6, 9. So here we're going to be just doing another practice question to have a look at some significant figures, make sure we're happy with that. We're going to do our exam technique there, looking carefully at what our um, values are, F, V, find lambda, Check all my units, they're all fine. I look at the number of marks. Recall my equation, rearrange it, substitute in my numbers. Now I get that out of the on my on my calculator. Doesn't mean you've done it wrong. It says in the question, calculate it to two significant figures. Now that is worth as many marks as recalling that equation and putting the numbers in. So please make sure you, you double check that it says that. You really don't want to miss that. That's why I'm colouring it in so much, because it's easy, easy marks and easily missed. So if I want to turn 0.166666, etc., into two significant figures, um, I ignore the zero at the start, and I'm looking at these next two numbers. So I can see 0.16, but I've got to, and 16 are my two important numbers, my two significant figures. I've got to look at the next one. If he's above five, I've got to round that six up into a seven to, um, to, to make it correct. So 0.166 would round to 0.17. Now, if it did ask me for three significant figures, I would look at the first three important numbers, 166. I'd look at the next number. Again, it's above five, so I'd round up the previous number. Okay, four sig, four sig figs is there as well. If it was going to be one sig fig, I'd look at, again, 0.1, look at the number after it. It's above five. I round up my one to be 0.2. So how do I rearrange things with three terms in? So let's have a look at our V equals F lambda, our really important equation for this topic. So I put them into an equation triangle. The triangle has already got a multiplied 
and a divide by sine in the equation triangle comes like that, I then do use this symbol here to tell me where to put stuff. Well, if f is times by lambda, I have to put f and lambda either side of the times, and then meaning I have to put my v up the top there. So if you want to find, let's say, lambda, cover up lambda, so cover it up here, and I've got to do what's left from top to bottom. If I want to find the f, I've got to do what's left from top to bottom, so v divided by lambda. And again, if I want to find v, I do what's down the bottom here, f times lambda. Should it be a little bit more complicated and I want to rearrange an equation that has three terms in it, so for example, v squared minus u squared equals 2as, they're going to give me u squared, or u. They're going to tell me a. They tell me s. They want me to find v. So let's have a look at how to do this. Well, you've always got to write down the equation, put the numbers in you're given in the right places, do the sums you can, do the opposite to both sides to get v on its own. So let's have a look at doing that then. Write down the equation, plug your numbers in that you're given. So here it is. You can see that 2 just stays there. My a is 15, my s is 20, my u is 5. Remembering to carry down the um, squares, they're really important there. Do the sums you can. So I can do the sum of 5 squared. I can do all of that sum all together. So 5 squared, 25. All of that together equals 600. So I've got this here. Do the same to both sides now to get rid of the minus 25. So add 25 to both sides, 625. To get rid of the squared there, I now take the square root. Okay, giving me V equals my answer there, 25 meters per second. Okay, so let's go through a little bit of content then. Um, just Actually, just before I go through a little bit of content, still with the math skills, let's have a quick look at this thing called uncertainty. Now, uncertainty is when I calculate averages, uh, we can have an uncertainty in a mean. Now, that means kind of how much do my results vary from a mean. Um, so if my results were 11, 12, and 13, well, my mean would be adding those three up and dividing by three, in which in this case would be 12. Now, my uncertainty is going to be my range of my values. So from 11 to 13, the range is 2. Now, my uncertainty is the range divided by 2. So it's range divided by 2. So here my range is 2, meaning I would write my mean with its uncertainty as 12 plus or minus 1, meaning that my results vary from the mean by 1. And if you go back and check it, well that's true, isn't it? My mean is 12 and my results vary from 1 away from that mean. Uncertainty hasn't come up in the other six papers, so it would seem reasonable to suggest that it, it might come up in this in this paper. So forces then, let's go through some of the basics of forces. If I have balanced forces, meaning forces of the same size on an object, um, it's either constant speed if it was already going at constant, uh, if it was already moving, or it's stationary if it if it wasn't moving beforehand. The speed doesn't change basically under balanced forces. Now, if I was to apply unbalanced forces, so I've got smaller force. Um, pushing uh, the lorry backwards and a bigger force, probably a thrust from the engine pushing it forwards, uh, well then I've got unbalanced forces, meaning that this uh, truck could either be accelerating or decelerating, depending on which way the resultant force was. Now resultant force is a really key part in this topic, so resultant force just means the overall force. So when I include two forces on an object which are both in the same direction, 60 and 30 will add together to make 90 newtons to the right. If they're in opposite directions, I'm going to kind of find the difference. So overall, this is going to have a bigger force to the right because it's 30 compared to 10. And so my overall force will be 30 take away my 10 to give me 20 newtons to the right. Remembering that forces have um, direction as well. So equation that relates force, mass and acceleration. Here's my FAM equation. If I want to know, for example, the acceleration, or sorry, the force being applied by this person here to push their van, well, if that's my acceleration A, and there is my mass there, I'm going to do 0.05 times 2,000 to give me the force applied by this person to push their van. Now, if I want to be able to calculate the acceleration of, of, of an object, and the acceleration literally means the change in speed per second. So here I'm going to use A equals V minus U over T. Now, forces and uh, speed, or sorry, let me start again, velocity and speed are two different things. Now, speed is what we call a scalar quantity. A scalar quantity, if you imagine scales, they don't have any direction. They only have size. 
So scalar quantities only have size, and vector quantities have both size and direction. Okay, so let's have a little look at distance time graphs then. So a few key facts about distance time graphs. So the gradient tells us the speed. Now, if I want to know the gradient of this line here, okay, nice and easy, let's say it goes right up into the corner there, I'm going to be able to find my gradient, which is the change in y over my change in x. Remembering we're not interested in counting these squares here, we want to know the readings off of the graph. So my y value is 3. My x value is also 3, so my speed, because the speed is the gradient, my speed would be 1 meters per second. Now, the steeper the graph, the faster it's going. So if I had a look at a graph line that looked like this, and then looked like this, and I said I've got section A and section B, well, section B is definitely faster because it's steeper. Now, really important that you know whether this is a distance time graph or a velocity time graph, and the only way to know is to look at the labels on the side. Now a horizontal line here means that it is um, it's stopped. So this section of the graph just here, section B, that section there is stopped because we can see that from three seconds to five seconds the distance doesn't change, so they're stopped. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, a curving upwards line means it's accelerating. So let me draw a curving upwards line. It's going to be like so. So here we have the line where I can see that each second I'm going on there, the distance is increasing by more and more each second. So this is a accelerating line. And then when it starts to curve downwards, so for example, like so, we could say that this part is decelerating. It's covering less and less um, distance each second. Now, we haven't seen any calculations of gradients yet, so let's just have a look here and say that this uh, distance time graph had a shape like this, and it wanted you to find out the um, speed when the car or the object was moving at three seconds. So to do that, we're going to need to take the gradient just here. How to find the gradient of a curve? You're going to draw a tangent, so the tangent has to be at kind of 90 degrees to the radius here, so the tangent is going to be somewhere along this line, and forgive me because I'm using a pen here to draw this, um, that we're going to then draw a triangle around this tangent. And this triangle will then tell us the gradient at that point there. So we're going to do again our change in y over the change in x, and we're going to use the um, scale on the side there to work out exactly what the change in y is. So what, one, two, three, um, three point six and over here from naught up to five point six here approximately okay and we would do three point six over five point six to tell us our speed at that exact point okay velocity time graphs then so something slightly different they tell us here the gradient this time tells us the acceleration well how do i know that well because if i have a shallow line or I have a steeper line, I can see that during these three seconds here, the velocity isn't changing very much, it's going up just a little bit, so we've got a slow rate of increase of speed, slow acceleration, and up here we have a higher acceleration. Um, so the steeper, the higher the acceleration, and what does a flat line tell us? So a flat line here, or indeed I could have a flat line down here, it tells us that it's at constant speed. Now, if it's up here, my constant speed is 3. If my, it's down here, my constant speed is 0, so stopped. Now, something really useful here is that the area between this red line I've drawn and the x-axis, that area there, tells me the distance that this object has travelled. Now, to be able to do this, divide up my shape into objects that I can find the area of. So here I've got a triangle. That's going to be uh, a half times base times height and here's a rectangle so it's just going to be base times height and again here is a triangle so a half times base times height i'm going to add them all together and that will tell me the distance that this has traveled so just to recap distance time graph steepness tells me speed flat line means stopped and over on this side steepness tells me acceleration flat line means constant speed area under the graph tells me the distance traveled
Okay, so um, mass then, mass and weight. Mass is how much stuff you're made of, measured in kilograms. Weight is how hard your mass pushes on the ground. That's measured in newtons. Weight equals mass times gravity, where weight is measured in newtons and mass is measured in kilograms. Now, terminal velocity, so objects falling out of the sky, uh, they depend on shape and area. So the larger the area, the lower the terminal velocity. Terminal velocity is a constant speed. It's the maximum falling speed that someone's reached. So the forces are balanced if it's at a constant speed. So that downward weight of gravity and the upward force of air resistance are exactly the same size. So why do why do falling objects reach a top speed? Or well, this could be why do cars reach a top speed, or vans, or buses, or trains, or anything? So as the object falls faster, in the case of um, falling to the earth, where, as the objects fall faster, sorry, as the object falls, they get faster. As they get faster, the air resistance increases with speed until it's as large as the downward force from the weight. When they balance, the object no longer accelerates. So when someone first jumps out of a plane, they have a downward force of their weight and a very small upward force. As they increase in speed, their downward force stays the same, but their upward force starts to get a bit bigger until eventually they balance out. It's going fast enough that the air resistance balances out the weight, and that is going to be a constant speed. Okay, if it is a car they're talking about, obviously the arrows are going to be horizontal, and the um, instead of gravity or weight pulling them down, it's going to be the thrust force from the engine. Okay, so the waves topic then. So transverse waves, the vibrations are at 90 degrees in the direction of the energy transfer. So for example, light or EM waves. So trans meaning across, as in transport or transatlantic. Longitudinal waves, the vibrations are parallel to the direction of energy transfer. So we can see here that the energy transfer is moving that way. A hand is moving in the same direction as the wave is going. Here, the hand is moving across the direction that the wave is going. Now, really important that we use this word. We don't use the word wave. We use the word energy transfer. So parallel to the energy transfer and, and um, 90 degrees to the energy transfer. So on our on our waves here, on our wave here, we can measure the wavelength, which is peak to peak. It is also trough to trough, or it's zero point to zero point. I'm making sure it includes a down and an up. So that is our wavelength there. Um, that's called the peak. That's called a trough. And here we have our longitudinal wave. And this here is where the air particles are close together and close together. So one wavelength will be from the middle of a um, compression to the middle of the next compression. You could also draw it from the start of a compression to the start of a compression, or you could do it from the middle of a rare refraction to the middle of a rare refraction, whatever looks easiest to, sorry, that isn't right, that last one, from the middle of a rare refraction to the middle of the next rare refraction, whatever looks easiest to you to measure. So frequency means how many waves go past per, se per second, it's measured in hertz. And the time period is how long it takes for one wave to go past. And that's where that's involved with our, um, our equation here of t equals 1 over f. Okay, so looking at the topic of waves here, the electromagnetic spectrum, you need to have a good mnemonic here for remembering the order of these. Um, so our um, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma rays. And just be aware that your mnemonic may run G to R, or it could run R to G, but you need to know which end has the shorter wavelength. So gamma rays are really dangerous. They've got a really short wavelength. Radio waves, really not dangerous. They've got a really long wavelength. Microwaves used for cooking food because they heat up they heat up the water molecules in there, make them vibrate. Um, infrared can possibly cause a little bit of burning um, to skin, um, used in remote controls. They don't burn skin, but toasters give out infrared that can. Visible light used for seeing. Um, ultraviolet used for maybe identifying banknotes. Um, X-rays, obviously, to look at bones. 
Now, when the wavelength goes from big to small, the frequency does the opposite. So the frequency with a small wave is really big, and the frequency um, is much smaller when the waves are big. So radio waves are kilometers long, um, but only a, you know only a few will go past each second compared to uh, gamma rays where the where the wavelength is really small, but the frequency is enormous. Okay, electromagnetism. So our planet acts as a magnet. It's got magnetic field lines around the outside of it. And when we draw the magnetic field lines around a bar magnet, take care not to draw them like that. Okay, they do, they come out of the end of the magnet and loop around. So let's draw that again. You make them come out of the north and loop back into the end again. They come out of the north and loop back into the end again. And you can just draw a few more coming out. Now, which way do the arrows go? They go north to south. Now, really make sure, you can all do this, take the time to make sure that all your arrows are pointing in the right direction. They go away from the north and towards the south. So every line you draw, you should be able to put a little arrow on to show it going into the south, out from the north. Okay, field lines show the force of attraction by the North Pole. So if I bring another North Pole over here, what's it going to feel? It's going to feel attraction that way. If I bring a North Pole over here, it's going to feel being pushed away. Now, the closer the lines are, the stronger the force. So that is, that's why the lines are closest together at the poles. That's where the force is strongest. Now, a diagram here to show the field lines between north and south. So we know that opposite poles attract. So our field lines are going straight in, pulling them together. Same poles, north and north or south and south, they repel. So our lines are going away from each other. Now, what's this for? This is a um, short practical to find the... Uh, magnetic field lines on a magnet. How do we do that? We place a compass at different positions around the magnet, mark where the North Pole is pointing to show the direction of the field. Okay, and as you can see on these little mini plotting compasses, they uh, go into this end, so we would expect that to be the south, and our north is up there. Okay, so electromagnetism then for combined science. We know that if we put uh, moving charges like electrons in electricity, if we make have moving charges, they create a magnetic field. Now, normally we would say current in a wire creates a magnetic field. Now, we can work out the direction of these magnetic field lines. So you can see that these are little circles. They don't touch the um, wire. They don't come out of the wire. They're little concentric circles around it. The wire, the, the loops should be closer together near the wire because that's where the force is strongest and they should spread out a little bit more as they get further away. And we can work out the direction of these based on the direction of the current through the wire. So you can see here, here the current is going upwards. If we use our right hand grip rule, so using our right hand with our thumb in the direction of the current, our fingers wrap round the wire to give us the direction of the of the field lines. So our fingers represent the field lines, our thumb represents current. Now if we're going to draw the field lines around an electromagnet, they look exactly the same as that on a normal magnet. And here we've got our coil of wire, and we can see our field lines going around it. Now we can increase the strength of a solenoid, a coil of wire, by increasing the current through it so more current stronger magnetic field increase the number of turns on it so more coils will make it stronger we can also add a soft iron core now when we add a soft iron core it becomes an electromagnet now steel can also be used as an iron core but steel stays uh, magnetic afterwards so it's not as useful in an electromagnet why because we want electromagnets to be able to turn on or off if you have a steel iron, iron core, they, they, they stay magnetic afterwards. So we can turn them on and off. We can also increase the strength of them. And that can be important if we were to uh, be in a scrapyard moving cars around. One, one car might be heavier than, than another. You can increase the strength of it. Now, I'd also like to say, please uh, feel free to ask some uh, questions. 
put them up on the wall and I'll try and answer them. So uh, someone has asked, can a distance time graph be directly proportional? Absolutely. A distance time graph just measures the uh, motion of an object, and a motion of an object can be pretty much anything, anything that, that we decide it to be. So a distance time graph could be any shape. So keep your questions coming. OK, now if we want to work out, if we know the direction of current in the coil, we can work out which end the north is. And we also use the right-hand grip rule for that. So you're going to wrap your fingers around in the direction of the current. Here we can see the current coming on up this side here. Our fingers wrap around the coil in the same way. And our thumb points north. OK, so it can be used for two things. If we know the direction of the current in a straight wire, it tells us the directions of the uh, field lines around it. And if we put it on a solenoid, it tells us the direction of the north if we know the direction of the current. Now, the rest of this broadcast is for higher tier or separate science only. So combined foundation pupils, thank you very much for listening. You've done a great job. 50 minutes of, uh, of time well spent, I hope. Um, the rest of this broadcast is for higher tier or separate science only. So let's get cracking. Higher tier, you don't have too much. Um, a little topic on electromagnetism and a little bit on forces as well. So let's have a look at uh, this uh, this topic here on uh, the left hand rule. So if I place this uh, wire here and it's got current through it, if I place the wire inside a magnetic field between a north and a south of a, of a magnet, well then that wire experiences a force and this is called the motor effect. The motor effect is the name of, uh, of the effect that is, is seen when a wire that has current in it is put in a magnet in a magnetic field and it feels a force, it'll move. So a current carrying wire placed in a magnetic field experiences a force because the magnetic field around the wire caused by the moving charges in the current interacts with the magnetic field of the magnet. They basically push apart from each other. Now we can find the direction if it tells us uh, the north and south pole and tells us the current, we can find out the direction of this uh, of this uh, movement by using Fleming's left hand rule. Has to be your left hand. Okay, now there's a few things about it. So um, thumb means motion. So our thumb is our motion. That's the direction of the force it's going to feel. Our first finger is the field. So our first finger field and our second finger is our current. So I'll go through that again. Thumb motion, first finger field, and second finger current. Okay, so we need to know a few things about which way do I point my, uh, my first finger and my second finger to know which way this is going to move. So you need to know that current always goes plus to minus. So on this diagram here, there's a little arrow there, you're going to want to look for that, but here it could well be that they put a plus and a minus there. Current goes away from the plus towards the minus. Magnetic field lines, again they're drawn on here for us with the arrows, but if they weren't, you need to know that they always go north to south, as we've seen on the previous slide. And you've literally got to pick, put your middle finger uh, in, into the computer in that way. Your first finger is going to be pointing uh, left to right, because that's the direction of the field lines, meaning that your thumb has to, the only way you can put your uh, middle finger that way into the computer screen, and your first finger to the right, means your thumb has to be pointing down if you've got your hand held correctly. Okay, now you might also need an equation to apply this, uh, to, in these situations. This is the F equals Bill equation that you're selecting from the equation sheet. Here's your units. Probably the, the main one you may not be familiar with is Tesla for magnetic flux density. And I've seen quite often they ask you to uh, combine this with another equation for a five marker. Just be aware here that, um, that if this wire here is being held, uh, let's say that they've uh, flipped the direction of the current and the force is being felt upwards here. And let's just say you've got an exam question which says that the wire is held uh, motionless because its uh, upward force is balancing its weight. Well, if you know its weight because you know the mass of the wire, don't forget that weight equals mass times gravity. So if they tell you the mass of the, um, of the wire, you may well be able to work out its weight, which would also be the size of the upward force if it's, if it's motionless. 
Okay, force diagrams is also a higher tier topic. So in the force diagrams, let's just say that you've got two forces acting on an object. Now we've already mentioned that when you've got two forces acting on an object, we can there is really one overall force that it's feeling. We call that the resultant force. Well, what is the resultant force? Um, I need to draw my two forces, draw them end to end, from arrow tip to arrow tip. Um, sorry, from arrow tip to start of the next arrow. Uh, the resultant force will be from the start point, so from the smiley face, to the tip of the last arrow. Measure the length of the one you want to move, measure the angle it is from the horizontal and redraw it. So I would measure that angle there, I'd measure that length there, and I'm going to redraw it now over here. So let's watch me do that. Okay, he appears back over here. My resultant force is going to be from the start point to the end of the tip of the arrow, is over there. So if I need to be able to say what size that force is, I'd measure it again using my same scale that I've used before, and I might want to measure that angle there from the horizontal. Or if they want to ask you it as a bearing, your bearing is from the north, so from straight up down to here. So bearings are from the north, or you might just be measuring it from the horizontal there. The exam question should tell you what how they want it presented. If in doubt, give it both ways, or just a, as a bearing from the north. Now, if the forces are balanced, so we've just seen that the resultant force would be from the start point to the tip of the last arrow when I've when I've joined them end to end. Well, if there is a zero resultant force, they should form a loop where I move them all end to end, and it should come back to the start. So this is for objects who are in balanced forces, have are not accelerating and not decelerating, they're either constant speed or stopped. So here I'm going to uh, measure each one carefully, measure the angle it makes with the horizontal or the vertical, move it, and do the same with this one over here. And I can see that they form a closed loop back to the start, so there is a resultant force of zero. Now let's just say here I've got a force um, which they want me to split into its x and y components. So basically we want to find out how big are those if we know that this is 20 newtons? Well, the first thing to do is find out what is the scale they've used. So if 20 newtons here equals, for example, four centimeters, I know that one centimeter would equal five newtons. So I then redraw it. I measure it carefully from the uh, horizontal. I'm going to redraw him, making sure he is uh, four centimeters in length. I'm then going to use a ruler to measure the length and the height of that tip of the arrow. And I'm going to want to make sure I use my same scale so I can convert that back into um, the Newtons again afterwards. OK, so that is it for Combined Scientists. So higher and Foundation, thank you very much for listening. That's just short of an hour for higher Combined. Um, so Separate Scientists, we're going to now rattle through the content for Separate Science. Hopefully should be about half an hour or so. Please feel free to ask questions um, and let me know if you, um, if you need anything. Okay, well done for uh, someone mentioning that I haven't hidden the comments. I've now hidden the comments, so feel free to write any questions you've got. No one else should be able to see those. Legend, whoever uh, commented on that. So thank you very much. Um, okay, so rest of the topic then, forces. Uh, so moments and levers. So what are they all about? They're um, force multipliers that basically let you increase a force without actually having to use a bigger force. And how they do that is you... Uh, you increase the distance between uh, where you're applying the force and, and where the force is, is, is needed. So what I mean is uh, the moment, the turning effect of a force is equal to the force I'm applying times by the um, perpendicular distance from the pivot. Perpendicular distance means, so here is my force being applied to this spanner here. Perpendicular distance means the distance from 90 degrees from that force up to the center of my pivot. So that is my distance there. On this spanner, that wouldn't matter too much. It'd be fairly easy to, to take that measurement. But on different, um, on different situations, it might be harder for you to, to take that measurement. So really important is at 90 degrees to where the force is. So here we have our effort. Okay, and our perpendicular distance would be at 90 degrees to that effort. So that there is our, our distance D. And similarly here, if our effort is that direction, and here is our pivot, we're going to want to find the distance between the uh, pivot 
and the fours. Now, if we want an object to balance, what we're going to need to know is that the uh, clockwise moment equals the anti-clockwise moment. So basically, on a seesaw, our turning effect that way is equal to our turning effect that way. Now, we might possibly see it with multiple objects on a seesaw. So I've got, let's say, an object here and an object here, and they balance with an object over here. OK, I just have to work out the moment of this object and that object and add them together. And those two moments added together should equal the moment over on this side. Okay, so levers, uh, sorry, gears now. Gears is a really small topic, but well worth knowing which way they, how they increase force. So gears are just discs with teeth around the edge, and they transmit a turning force from one place to the other. You've got them on a bicycle. They can also be used to increase the moment of a force or reduce the moment of a force. Now, if um, if this is my driver gear and this is the next one along, um, so I'm turning the driver gear and it's attached to a, a larger wheel, if I increase the size of the gear, it increases the moment. And the reason being for that is that I'm now further, my force is now being applied further from the pivot, and of course the further you are from the pivot, the stronger the turning force. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if I reduce the size of the wheel, I'm now reducing the distance from the pivot, so I'm reducing the size of the force. Okay, fluid pressure. So as I go deeper under the sea, uh, pressure increases with depth. And why does it do that? Well, it increases because the number of particles above uh, them increase, and the weight of all those particles um, uh, increases the force pushing down. So we might see with this uh, with this tall column of water, if I was to make holes all the way down, we'd see that the deeper the hole, the higher the pressure, so the further that water um, shoots out at the bottom there. Now, static uh, fl fluid pressure does not depend on the shape, the total mass, or the surface area of the liquid. And we've seen a, um, a GCSE question where you have sort of three weird shaped um, containers all connected together and um, it showed you the level of water in one of them, and it wanted you to show the level of water in them all. The, the level of the water will be exactly the same because the pressure will be exactly the same because the pressure isn't dependent on the shape of the container. So this is a separate science equation. So pressure at any point underneath the water is found by the density of that water times by the strength of gravity times by the height underneath that water. So it is literally only interested in the water that's above it that's in height, and we need to know the density of that water and the strength of gravity. Now, atmospheric pressure, similar kind of science here, at higher altitudes, air pressure is less. The higher the altitude, the fewer particles there are above, pressing down with a smaller force. So if we look at our guard stood on top of the mountain here, it's lower pressure because there's fewer atoms pressing down on him, and down at the bottom here more pressure because there's more particles above the weight of one of those particles pushing down on him. And here we go, we've got a, a graph showing a relationship between altitude and pressure. And we can see that the, um, the pressure is really low up high and increases with uh, as you get closer to the ground. So um, up thrust. Why do things float? Um, so this apple is displacing water. As it's, as it's in the water there, it's pushing some water out of the way. Now the size of the upthrust force, so there is a force from the water on the apple upwards, the size of that for force of the weight of the water it's displaced. So remembering that weight is a force, um, so the volume of water there, the weight of that volume of water will be the same size as the upthrust force. So we can say that that piece of water there will have the same weight as the upthrust. How can we explain this upthrust force? Well, uh, why does a cube of ice float upwards when in water? So this is to do with uh, fluid pressure again. And pressure increases with depth because of the weight of the particles pressing down from above. So here's my ice cube. Because pressure increases with depth, that means that there's going to be a there's going to be a higher pressure, therefore a higher force at the bottom. And you can see these force arrows tell us that there is a higher force upwards uh, due to the higher pressure than there is at the top downwards. 
So the base of an object feels a higher water pressure than the top, meaning a resultant force upwards, and this is called upthrust. The upthrust is equal to the weight of the water displaced. Okay, the rate of change of momentum. So uh, crumple zones in a car, airbags, seat belts, gym crash mats, cycle helmets, playground surfaces, what have they all got in common? They're all safety features which reduce the forces on a person. It's forces on a person that causes them injury. High forces are bad, low forces are good. So we, they do this by reducing the rate of change of momentum. In other words, they make going from a high momentum, because don't forget that momentum is mass times velocity, they make going from a high, mo high momentum to a low momentum, they make that occur over a longer period of time. So whenever you crash, you're going to have a high speed down to hopefully zero, but you want that to occur over a long period of time. So let's see how we do that. How can we prove that to reduce forces on a person in a crash, we need to increase the time they stop over? Well, F equals MA tells us that in order to reduce this force here, if I want the force to go down, I can't change the mass of myself in an accident, but I can reduce the deceleration. So I can make that number go down. How do I make the acceleration go down? Well, acceleration is change in speed over time. If I'm in a crash, I can't change my starting speed and my final speed. It's going to be fast to stopped. But I can change my um, time taken to stop. If I change my time taken to stop, I change my acceleration. My acceleration will go down. So we can combine these two things together. So let's have a look at this. F equals MA is my equation. I swap A for V minus U over T to make this equation here. Force equals mass times the change in speed over the time taken. So this is the rate of change of momentum because there is my momentum equation and it's how quickly does that, uh, that momentum change. Okay, waves topic. So we're in the waves topic, you need to know just a little bit more in depth about, um, about each of the individual waves. And so for long radio waves, it's used for long distance communication. The reason why it can be used for transmitting around the earth is it can bend or diffract around the surface of the earth. Medium wave radio can reflect off of the ionosphere. So it's reasonably high quality and it can bounce off the atmosphere. Short wave radio, again, high quality communications. Um, that's really clear, crisp um, broadcasts, again, can reflect off the ionosphere. TV and radio, okay, now they can only work in direct line of sight. And microwaves for satellites, well, why are they good? They can pass straight through in a straight line through the atmosphere. They're not reflected or absorbed or, or refracted. Microwaves for cooking, when well, it's absorbed by water molecules, these wavelengths, so it makes them vibrate, heating them up. Infrared cameras, they, all objects give out infrared, so the hotter the object, the more it gives out, so that's a useful application of that. Infrared cooking, uh, well, we can use a toaster to grill our toast because um, infrared causes objects to heat up. We can use infrared for heaters because infrared causes objects to heat up. We can use visible light in fiber optics, so fiber optic broadband is getting more popular. Light reflects off the walls of the glass fibers until it reaches the end. So you could have a little thin piece of glass and our light will just bounce around on the inside there and reflect around on the inside there. So UV tanning and sun, sun tanning, uh, UV light and sun tanning, why can we use this? Well, literally because UV tans the skin. UV light and security ink, well, UV hits fluorescent ink, which you can't normally see. Uh, it's absorbed and it's emitted as visible light, so it kind of makes it glow. We use UV in fluorescent lights because there's UV that hits a fluorescent material on the inside of the bulb, it gets absorbed, and then emitted as visible light. X-rays in imaging, well, X-rays pass through flesh, but not bone. They're absorbed by bone or metal, so they turn um, a white detector plate, they turn it black the more rays hit it. So that's why your bone in the middle of, a, um, in the middle of an X-ray will appear white, while everything else will appear black, and that's supposed to be a bone on an X-ray. I clearly can't draw those. And gamma rays and X-rays for cancer treatment, well, why? Because they kill all cells. Gamma rays are also used as medical tracers. So a medical tracer is where you might swallow um, a meal which contains um, uh, 
radioactive materials and this is because it passes through the body it will pass out of the body um, easily to be detected so a little bit on lenses then so this here is a convex lens when i shine parallel rays of light at it they're going to converge so we call it a converging lens or a convex lens they're going to converge and they're going to go through a focal point f concave lenses cave because of the inward shape of that lens there uh, this is a diverging lens, diverging meaning that they're going to split apart. Now, we can find the focal point here by drawing imaginary lines backwards, and where they cross now, that will be the focal point. Magnification of an object is the image height over the object height. So if we find that the image is smaller than the object, we should have a number which is less than one. If we find that the uh, image is bigger, which is most things make images bigger, uh, we're going to find that the magnification is greater than one, so telescope or micro, uh, microscope. Now, when we draw our uh, ray diagrams, there are some golden rules here, which are going to make this um, much easier to be able to, uh, to draw. So the golden rules are draw a, uh, a ray undeflected through the, sorry, through the, straight through the lens. So here's our object. Here's a focal point on either side. Here's my convex lens. So convex is that shape. I'm expecting it to make the rays come together, okay, from the previous slide. So draw one ray straight through the middle of the lens. The next one goes parallel to the axis and then bends at the lens through the focus on this side. So parallel to the lens through the focus. Okay, should I need to, I can draw one on this side as well. So through this focus on this side, then, then parallel. And I'm going to see that my image is where the rays cross. Okay, so I'm going to keep the base of the object on the axis. And then I'm just going to draw the top of the object, just like it, the light comes from the top of the object here. That light is going to be at the top of the image there. Now I can say that this, oh, excuse me, I can say that this image here is inverted upside down. Here's a real image because I can project him on a screen. And he is diminished. Uh, diminished because he's smaller so if he wasn't inverted we would say he's upright if he wasn't real we would say um, virtual and if he wasn't diminished we would say magnified meaning the opposite okay sometimes if I bring an, an object inside the focal point we get something a bit weird happens so let's follow our same three golden rules. Ray straight through the middle of the lens. Okay, ray goes parallel to the axis and then through the focal point. Okay, well that's weird because I want my rays to be able to cross over somewhere. So what's going to happen here? Okay, well I can still make my um, ray go from the focus uh, to the center of the lens and then go parallel. So still applying my third ray and you might think what a mess this is. Well, the magic here is that I can draw imaginary lines backwards to the point where they'll meet up again. So you can see these are spreading apart. I've got to draw rays going backwards. And when I draw those rays go backwards, they cross at the same point, thankfully, telling me that my image is going to be over here. So what can we say about the image this time? We can say that the image is upright. We can say it's a virtual image because I can't project it on a screen. And we can say that it is um, magnified because it's much bigger than my object. So this could be, for example, a magnifying glass. Okay, black body radiation. So we've already seen in our Leslie cube that um, dull black is the best emitter and that shiny silver is the worst emitter. Well, black body radiation, the perfectly black objects are also the best absorbers as well as the best emitters. So the color black is not only the best absorber of heat radiation, but also of all electromagnetic radiation. A black body would absorb all the EM radiation that hits it. They would also be the perfect emitters of radiation as well. So it won't reflect or transmit anything. Now, actually, a perfect black body doesn't really exist, but it helps us to understand some important physics ideas. So it's the perfect absorber and emitter. Now, a black body uh, would absorb all the EM radiation that hits it and be the perfect emitter. It won't reflect or transmit anything. Now, let's have a look at these three stars here. We've got a red star, a yellow star, and a blue star, all at different temperatures. Our red star is the coolest, 4,000 Kelvin, and our blue star is the hottest there. Ignore the Kelvin, it could be Celsius equally. 
So we can see the blue star is hot, is the hottest. And we can see the red star is the coolest. Let's have a look at these different wavelengths of uh, EM waves that they're giving out. And here we've got intensity, basically meaning brightness. So what can we see here? Well, hot objects emit infrared, but they don't just emit infrared because actually infrared is around, uh, is around here. So they emit a range of wavelengths around infrared. Now, the, the amount and type emitted depends on its temperature. So exactly which wavelengths are shown, as in what the distribution of wavelengths are, changes depending on how hot it is. Now, what do you really need to know? You need to know that as objects get hotter, the intensity of the peak increases. As in, when objects go from cool to hot, the peak intensity goes up. And you also need to know that the wavelength of that peak decreases. So here's the peak um, wavelength when it's cool. Here's the peak wavelength when it's warmer. And here's the peak wavelength when it's at its hottest. So the wavelength of the peak goes down. The intensity of the peak goes up. Okay, sound and ultrasound. So ultrasound is any sound or vibration above human hearing or above 20,000 hertz. You can answer either one of those will get you the mark for what is it. Ultra kind of giving you the clue there that it's ultra meaning like above. How does imaging with ultrasound work? So if we want to be able to take a picture of a, a fetus um, uh, inside a, a womb. So what happens there is you get a partial reflection at each interface. So every time there is a boundary between a different material, you get a partial reflection as shown here. A little bit gets reflected, a little bit passes through. Now the reflected pulse is detected. So this reflection is detected here, and the time delay between the layers is used to indicate the distance between the layers. So for example, on a, on a oscilloscope, you can see maybe the peak uh, where the skin is reflecting, where the bone is reflecting, and then the back of the bone. We can use the time delay. As long as we know the speed of the waves through that, we can work out the distance between the layers, and that can build up a lovely picture for us. So we get fuzzy images, but they're really safe. And if you think about comparing it to x-rays, that's going to be really important with, um, with fetuses. OK, question about uh, lenses, therefore. Is the principal focus the same as the focal point? Yep, the principal focus is exactly the same as the focal point. And the focal length is just the distance from the uh, center of the lens to the focal point or the principal focus. So focal length, distance from the lens to the focus. And the principal focus is exactly the same as the focal point. So a couple of uses of our ultrasounds here. Well, it's used for destroying kidney stones, um, literally because it just vibrates the kidney stones to pieces. Cleaning watches, so antique watches maybe. Um, detecting flaws in materials, cracks in building materials, so steel girders used for um, large, um, large buildings, things like that. Okay, visible light and colour. So white light is made of three primary colours, uh, red, blue and green. Now red paint absorbs all colours apart from uh, red, which it reflects. Green paint uh, re absorbs all colours except green and so on. Now the only things you might want to know there is that black paint absorbs all light and uh, white paint reflects, uh, sorry let me put that around the, uh, the right way, black paint absorbs all light reflecting none white paint reflects all light absorbing none. Now filters, filters work by only letting the color through the, the, that is the color of the filter. So all of the other colors are absorbed apart from red light. Now if we have a look at a blue dress, a blue dress is absorbing all of the wavelengths apart from blue. <coughs> Excuse me, so green paint, uh, sorry, green light and red light are being absorbed by the dress. It's only reflecting blue light. But if I was to put a red filter over this, because a red filter only lets red light through it, and there is no red light coming off of the dress, the dress would look black. OK, electric motors and loudspeakers. So all of this kind of topic of the electro, um, electromagnetism all really have similar 
similar kind of uh, science behind them, underpinning them. So how a speaker works then, let's have a quick look at our diagram here, what have we got? Okay, we've got a speaker cone, that's the kind of cone shaped thing you might see on the front of a speaker. Behind the cone, so when we look at the front of a speaker it might look like so. Well there's our cone here from the front, normally you might have another little one at the top there. So this is our cone that we see on the front of the speaker. Inside we've got a, uh, this cone is attached to a coil of wire just here and this coil of wire is inside this kind of magnet so there's a north and a south shape of the magnet now from above the magnet looks like this I've got a north in the middle I've got a groove in it where my coil sits and then this circular bit around the outside is the south pole all the way around so my coil sits as I'm looking at it from above sits in there like that now from the side he looks like this so we've got an input voltage where I'm putting in some electricity into my coil of wire now let's think about what happens when I put electricity through a coil of wire it becomes an electromagnet having a magnetic field around it so let's see how this works AC current is sent to the coil my coil of wire which is attached to my paper cone the coil is inside a strong magnetic field of the magnet when current is flowing it generates a magnetic field around the coil just like an electromagnet this interacts with the magnetic field from the magnet and it generates a force which moves the cone as the alternating as the current alternates backwards and forwards it moves the cone backwards and forwards creating areas of compression and rare refraction which are sound waves so cone moves in and out as it moves in and out it compresses and rarefies the air in front of it the frequency of the sound waves are the same as the frequency of the AC current okay generator effect then so this time instead of using electricity to make kinetic energy as in a, uh, a motor we can reverse this process and we can turn the movement into electricity so here we have a, um, a magnet and that magnet is being moved into and out of a coil of wire now the generator effect is the induction of a potential difference across a conductor the conductor being the coil of wire induction meaning to induce meaning to create the, con the creation of a potential difference across the conductor now if I connect it in a complete circuit current can flow so when the conductor uh, and this is when the, the conductor experiences a changing magnetic field so I'll say this again the generator effect is when I induce a potential difference in a conductor when that conductor is experiencing a changing magnetic field so how do I produce a changing magnetic field I literally either move the coil in and uh, sorry move the magnet in and out or I move the coil in and out so what factors can affect the size of an induced current? So the current that I might feel here on my ammeter would be the speed of the movement, so how fast I move that in and out. What affects the direction of the induced current? Well, the direction of the movement of the magnet or coil. So as I move it in, the current will flow one way. As I pull it out, the current will flow the other way. Now, if I swap the magnet round, swap the poles round, that will also change the direction of the current. Now, when a current is induced in a conductor, the induced magnetic field opposes the original change. So what I mean by that is, is if I move a south pole, if I move the south pole into a coil like here, the induced current in the coil creates a magnetic field in it that opposes the change that I'm, that I'm trying to do. So if I'm pushing a south pole in, it's going to want to oppose that so how to oppose a south pole going in is to create a south pole here which pushes against it because they repel if I was to pull the south pole out it's going to want to oppose that so it creates a north pole there to attract the magnet back in again now applications of the generator effect so here we have the standard generator it's what's used in power stations and wind turbines and it produces AC electricity so it looks really similar to a motor but this time instead of me putting in kinetic energy and getting out electricity sorry <laughs> let me try that again this looks like the electric motor but instead of putting in electricity and getting out kinetic energy I am putting in kinetic energy and getting out electricity 
Now the standard generator, the alternator, produces AC current. It just has slip rings and brushes. It doesn't have the split ring commutator. So this is going to, as the coil is rotated by whatever's powering it, steam turbine, steam passing through the blades of a turbine or a wind turbine, this coil is going to cut through the magnetic field lines of the magnet and it's going to induce a, a voltage in that coil. As one side of the coil moves upwards, the current will flow. And as it spins down, that same side moves down through the field lines, the current will flow in the opposite direction. So as it spins round, it's going to make the current go forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards as it spins round. So this is going to give us the output um, of AC current, where my voltage uh, alternates in the plus and the minus direction, forwards and backwards, each second. Applications of the generator effect, so the dynamo, uh, this could be used in batteryless uh, bicycle lights and wind-up torches. It produces DC. The reason why it produces DC is because we've got one of these split ring commutators here. So it's got a split ring commutator, so the connection swaps every time. And this keeps the current flowing in the same direction each time. So this produces DC current. OK, so applications of the generator effect, the dynamo, because of its uh, split ring commutator, the current's only going to be flowing forwards. Now, of course, we don't get any voltage induced at the point where the, um, the motor, the loop of the motor, needs to cut through field lines. And of course, if these field lines are going horizontal here, when the wire is um, sat upright, so it's at the top here, that wire is not cutting through any of the field lines as it goes along the top, at the very top where it's going horizontal. It's only where it cuts through field lines that it, it induces voltage. So microphones. Really, it's the same story as speakers, just in reverse. So instead of having an AC input, and it producing kinetic energy as the sound wave making the cone move. This time it's going to be sound waves that make the cone move um, that ends up giving out an electrical signal. So sound hits the thin cone, making it vibrate. So those areas of compression and rare refraction in the sound wave. The cone is connected to a coil of wire, so just a normal copper wire. That is inside a magnet, so in a magnetic field. So the cone moves the coil of wire when sound waves hit it. The moving coil cuts through the field lines of the magnet. This induces an alternating current in the coil, which has the same frequency as the sound wave. So the frequency that's in the electrical signal that comes out will be the same as the frequency of the sound waves that go in. So transformers. So uh, from our P1 paper, we know that that is the national grid. And the national grid, the purpose of it is to transmit electricity around the country. It does that in an energy efficient way by stepping up the voltage uh, to reduce energy loss through heating. And it steps down the voltage to make it safe for consumers to use. Well, we need to be able to do some calculations now. Now, if we look at the transformer in a bit more detail, we've got a primary side. That really just means an input side where uh, if it's a step, if it's here next to the power station, this will be the uh, where the energy, the electricity from the power station comes, and this is it being, um, you know, sent to the to the cables. So on this side, we can see we've got lots and lots of coils here. On this side, we can see we've got fewer coils. Now the ratio of the number of coils on both sides is the same as the ratio of the voltages. So. This gives us our equation of the voltage in the secondary over the voltage in the primary. So our ratio of voltages is the same as the ratio of the number of turns. This equation is lovely because we can swap it round if we need to. So you can literally just flip it and it's still correct. So VP over VS equals NP over NS. Um, S and P just meaning primary and secondary. V and N just meaning number of turns and voltage. We can flip it around, so that can make the mass handling just a little bit easier. Now we pretty much say that these are um, these are nearly 100% efficient. They're not really, but we do like to say to make the calculations a bit easier. We can say that the power in equals the power out, because that means that we can do P equals IV 
because P equals IV, I can say that the current times the voltage on the input side, on the primary side, is the same as the current times the voltage on the secondary side. Now, really, they're not 100% efficient. Actually, there'll be a little bit of warmth. It'll make the transformer warm up a bit um, and um, make it waste a little bit of energy. Now, a couple of notes about what this is made of. This is made of iron, this, uh, this square here. It, it's not made of copper. It doesn't transmit any electricity. It's made of iron because it can, um, it can just funnel the magnetic field lines through there. And we want the field lines to be felt across both sides because of our explanation of how this works. So here's a close-up of our transformer. Apologies for the fuzzy image. So AC current goes into the primary coil. It has to be AC because we need it to be um, a changing current. Now the primary coil produces a constantly changing magnetic field. Because the current is flipping directions, the magnetic field will flip directions. So there will be a magnetic field around this, which is flipping backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Now this magnetic field is felt by the secondary coil. You don't need to say much more than that. It's felt by the secondary coil over here. This induces an alternating voltage in it. This is called electromagnetic induction. And the secondary coil experiences the same frequency of voltage as the AC in the primary. So let's just go through that again. The primary coil um, creates a changing magnetic field around it because of AC current. That's felt by the secondary coil. It's called electromagnetic induction. And the secondary coil has the same voltage as the, um, so the same frequency of voltage as the input voltage on the primary coil. Okay, on to something slightly um, maybe more fun than Transformers. Uh, the space topic. So, in our solar system, we've got one star, the sun, plus our eight planets, and the dwarf planets that orbit around the sun. We've got natural satellites as well. So there are moons that orbit planets. They're also part of our solar system. And our solar system is part of the Milky Way galaxy. And our sun was formed from a cloud of dust and gas called a nebula, uh, pulled together by gravitational attraction gravity that made them all uh, stick together so let me just quickly have a look for some any posts up on the wall here so we've got um what's the difference between a vibration generator and a signal generator so that'll be in our waves um, measuring the speed of waves um required practicals a vibration generator literally generates vibrations for maybe um waves on a string to make the way to make the string rattle up and down um, a signal generator could well be an electrical signal generator, so it might be generating um, an AC signal in um, uh, maybe in a, for a speaker. Um, they're, they're almost exactly the same thing. It's basically you would set the frequency of the signal generator and the vibration generator, and it would tell you, and, and that would decide how many waves per second are coming out of it, either as electrical signal or as actual motion and movement. So keep your questions coming, um, pop them up on the wall there. So this is about the life cycle of stars. And people revising today seem to seem to really know this. All stars start out as protostars. Um, dust and gas falls into the protostar due to gravity. Um, that falling gas and dust heats up. When it gets really hot, fusion starts. And when fusion starts, the sun comes to life. The star comes to life, and we call it a main sequence star. So fusion has started at this point. And we can see there are going to be three pathways through this uh, life cycle of stars. You need to know each of the three pathways. Um, so for the smallest mass stars, they use up all their fuel as a main sequence star. They expand um, because there is uh, a larger outward force of uh, uh, pressure of fusion. The inward force of, of the weight of the star stays the same. Um, once they've used up the rest of the last of their fuel as a red giant, they're going to cool down into a white dwarf. And they'll cool down even more into a black dwarf, and they'll just stay there like that. So that's the smallest mass stars. Now, heaviest mass stars, they go from being a main sequence star, and because they're heavier, we call them a red supergiant. Now, these ones, once they've used up the last of their fuel, um, they're going to rapidly contract inwards as they as they use the last of their fuel. Um, the outward force of uh, fusion really drops dramatically, meaning they collapse inwards. And as they collapse inwards, this is now during a supernova. As they collapse inwards, um, there is uh, an increase in temperature, which does the last little bit of fusion. And this last little bit of fusion is really important 
because in this last little bit of fusion, it's so dramatic, so much energy is released that the star explodes in one of the largest events that happens in our universe, an exploding star. And during this supernova, uh, elements which are higher than iron in the periodic table, heavier than iron in the periodic table are made. Up until this point in the red supergiant, up until the supernova, um, fusion is fusing together all the small nuclei into larger nuclei and working its way up through the periodic table. So all of the elements which are found on our planet are because our planet is made from the dead remains of old exploded stars, which includes old supernovas. And we know that because we have elements heavier than iron on our planet. Now, after a supernova, you're going to end up with something left behind called a neutron star, literally just made of pure neutrons. And these are very, very dense. And our medium-sized stars will end as that. Now, the very heaviest mass of stars will end up going from a neutron star straight into a black hole. So it collapses under its own mass, and it has no volume, and it's so dense, it's got such high gravity that light itself can't escape from it. So we call it a black hole because light can't escape from it. You can't see it. Okay, orbital motion. So velocity um, is speed and direction. It is a, a vector quantity. And when in circular motion, the velocity is constantly changing, but not the speed. So it's accelerating. Because acceleration is a changing velocity. So we can see our object going around here. If we were to cut this string at any point, the object would just fly off at a tangent to the circle. So an example of uniform circular motion, a planet, the moon around the Earth, um, fairground rides. So if a planet or a moon is in a stable orbit, meaning its height isn't changing, if the speed changes, the orbit radius has to change too. So to make things spin closer to the, um, to the, to the centre, we need a faster speed. So Mercury orbits very quickly. And if we have a larger radius, we need a slower speed um, because... Um, this is because the force of gravity is stronger the closer to the object you are. Okay, uh, just looking at the questions on the wall there, we've got how do you know that the image is diminished, etc., on ray diagrams? So what you do is you look for the where the rays cross, you're going to draw an image, and um, you compare the size of the image to the size of the object. So the, the object is what you drew the rays from at the start, and if your image is smaller than the object, we call it diminished, meaning it's got smaller, and if the image is bigger than the object, we call it magnified. Okay, keep those questions coming up on the wall because this is our last few minutes. So redshift then. Uh, redshift is a, is a really great piece of science, a, really, um, a, a recent discovery that's proved so much about what our universe is and, 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 and how to explain it. So um, if we have a look at object moving towards us or away from us, so when an object when an object is moving, let's say we are this eye here, when an object moves towards us, the waves that are given out to it become compressed because as the object moves, each is moving towards the wave front it's just given out. So if it's giving out the same frequency of waves um, and it's moving towards you, the waves appear squidged up. And similarly, if I have an eye that's over here looking at this light over here and the object is moving away from me, well, each time it gives out that same frequency of wave, the waves are going to be spread out. So light waves are stretched, um, showing redshift, and light waves can be squashed, showing something called blue shift. Now, when we look up at our star, um, we see the rainbow of colours from it, and we see that there are little black strips on the rainbow of colours from our star. Each black strip represents, it is due to the atoms that are in the, in the sun. So those atoms absorb specific frequencies of light, and we can show this in a lab. So we call these absorption lines. Now, when the Earth is looking at a star which is the same distance from us, like our sun, we can see where those absorption lines are. Now, when the sun, uh, when a, another star can be seen to be moving away from us, well, those absorption lines just shift a little bit. They shift over, and they shift towards the red end because the light waves are stretched and red light is slightly longer wavelength than blue light. So when objects move away from us, their wavelength becomes stretched and the absorption lines move towards the red end of the spectrum. So this is evidence for, we'll explain why in a second, this is evidence for the universe expanding. How does it prove this? So light from distant galaxies is more red than expected. The majority of distant galaxies 
are much redder than expected. The absorption lines in the light are shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. The further the galaxy is away from us, the more red shifted it is, and so the faster it is moving away from us. Now this means that all of space is expanding. And I saw a, a model for this. So when you first, when you make um, a kind of bread with currents in it, and you first put it into the oven, it hasn't risen. And so the currents are all quite close to each other. And then the bread will have risen after a little while in the oven. And each of those uh, currents will now, when they look at each other, let's say this red current in the middle, this current in the middle looking at the others, all of the other currents will appear to have moved away from it. Okay, no matter which direction it looks, every current has moved away from it. And that is because literally the bread has expanded and we're seeing the same thing in our universe. If we rewind all of the positions of the galaxies right now, rewind them all to when they started off in the same place, well, this proves the Big Bang Theory. Okay, so just over 13 billion years ago, we can, we can, um, we can find the exact date of the Big Bang because when we rewind the position of all of the stars in the, in, of the galaxies in the universe, we rewind um, where the positions would be. They all joined together in one spot um, just over 13 billion years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been great. Thank you very much for listening. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Um, best of luck in your exam tomorrow. Don't forget a protractor. Um, and well done for all your hard work over the last few years. Keep it up. Good luck.